Oh, great mystical wise person, I have climbed for days through the Himalayas to find your tiny cave and to ask you... You know, you don't have to climb. There's there's a funicular that leaves from Pokhara. Hmm, there's what? A funicular? You know, like a, a little mountain cable car thingy? It leaves on the hour and it comes up the back way. You should take it when you leave here and then you can just get an Uber to Kathmandu. But the ticket is 18 bucks one way on the funicular. When I found that out, I was like, hey, I'm a mountain hermit wise person. Where do you think I'm going to get 18 bucks? What a rip off. I feel like we're getting a little off the subject. Okay, what did you want to ask me? What is beauty? Two words. Marishka Hargate. Uh, what, what are those two words again? Marishka Hargate. She is totally hot. I wasn't really asking you who is hot. I was asking, what is beauty? Like, does beauty exist in some platonic realm uninfluenced by human thought? Look, who's the mountain hermit wise person here? You or me? I mean, you climbed all the way up here, asked a question, and now you're all like telling me I should have a platonic relationship with Marishka Hargate. That shows how much you know. I would totally make out with Marishka Hargate if she came up here. See, again, I think we're getting off the subject. I'll tell you what the subject is, Sonny. You put your question back in whatever box of Fruit Loops you got out of, and you go back to civilization, and you tell Marishka Hargate that if she wants to come up here, I will totally buy her funicular ticket. Eighteen dollars. And I'm a hermit. I've been eating yak liver for the last two days. And that contains the answer to your question. I don't understand. Beauty is what anybody would pay $18 for. Even if that person's idea of a night on the town is when the funicular hits a yak and there's roadkill for stew. Now get out of here. The rest of you listen to a show about beauty. And now his idea of beauty is Betsy DeVos wearing a... You know what? Even I can't say that. It's just too weird. Colin McEnroe. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> I don't usually do this, but I'm going to begin with a little bit of a soliloquy to kind of set up the topic. Um, about two years ago, after a week of biking alone in the Dordogne region of France, I found myself standing on what's called the Pont Valentre in Cahors and beginning to weep. And my conscious understanding of that emotion was a reaction to seeing so much beauty in such a short time. I might have also been a little lonely, but mainly it was the beauty of the French countryside. But what does that mean? Why would that be so powerfully different from any other landscape that I might see all the time? Why does a still life by Odilon Redon make me stop in my tracks and stare and feel myself being just recharged by that beauty? What in that context is beauty? So Ezra Pound wrote a two-line poem about what beauty was to him, and then he tried to explain it. He said, three years ago in Paris, I got out of a metro train at La Concorde and saw suddenly a beautiful face, and then another, and another, and then a beautiful child's face, and then another beautiful woman, and then I tried all day to find words for what this had meant to me, and I could not find any words that seemed to me worthy or as lovely as that sudden emotion. In a poem of this sort, one is trying to record the precise instant when a thing outward and objective transforms itself or darts into a thing inward and subjective. That's my Ezra Pound impersonation. People say it's uncanny. Uh, but anyway, that's sort of what we're talking about today, right? When, how, what's the precise instant when an outward and objective thing that is beautiful trans transforms itself and darts into a thing inward and subjective, the, the subjective... Uh, experience of beauty. So we get a lot of our, our ideas about beauty from culture and what culture says um, is that beautiful people are more interesting, more virtuous, and kind of essential. I keep coming back to the film ad ad adaptation of Terence McNally's Frankie and Johnny and the Claire de Lune. The play was about two beautiful people, oh, excuse me, about two people who are, to quote from their own lines, middle-aged and not beautiful. They are not beautiful people. Um, and the fact that Frankie, uh, the female, is, shall we say, not slender is mentioned also in the play. The part was essentially written for Kathy Bates, and her Broadway performance was acclaimed. When it came down to make the movie, whom did they cast? Michelle Pfeiffer, such a universal icon of beauty that 25 years later, they're still uptown funking about her. They weren't willing to spend a lot of money on a love story that did not include a beautiful woman. And how many movies have you seen where you were asked to believe that Anne Hathaway is plausibly drab, at least at the beginning? In fact, Hathaway 
is sort of the queen of that essential transformation from ugly duckling to beautiful princess in movies. It's written right into the DNA of that idea that you don't realize your potential until you become beautiful. Um, and, you know, that's in our mythology. It's in, it's in the story of Helen of Troy, although she's kind of a complicated Melania Trump kind of person. But Cinderella, her beauty is proof of her virtue and her deservingness. And the ugliness of her stepsisters goes hand in hand with their ill temper. And let us not forget why Snow White had to die. Here's why. Magic mirror on the wall. Who is the fairest one of all? Famed is thy beauty, majesty. But hold, a lovely maid I see. Rags cannot hide her gentle grace. Alas, she is more fair than thee. Alas for her. Reveal her name. Lips red as the rose, hair black as ebony, skin white as snow. Snow white. Beauty is so important that she can't even stand to have Snow White exist. So where has this led us? Well, we have surrendered the leadership of our republic and possibly the future of the world to a man who used to own beauty pageants and who obsessively evaluates women in terms of their beauty, even assigning them numbers. I'm not going to play that clip. It's too disgusting. I've changed my mind. But there's a clip of Donald Trump on The Howard Stern Show assigning numerical values to women. Um... But other than President Trump's extremely helpful scale, do we have any real understanding of beauty? Beauty exists in all kinds of forms, not just in women. It's all over the place. So uh, we are going to talk about that with a series of very interesting uh, guests today. This whole thing started, in my mind, uh, out in Palm Springs in December when I heard Anjan Chatterjee, one of our guests, um, talk about this very notion. Anjan Chatterjee, Chatter Chatterjee is a professor and chair of neurology at Pennsylvania Hospital member of the uh, Center for Cognitive Neuroscience at the University of Pennsylvania and the author of The Aesthetic Brain, How We Evolved to Desire Beauty and Enjoy Art. I think we would be mad also to undertake a concept uh, like this one without involving our friend Maria Konnikova, writes a column on psychology and culture for The New Yorker and is the author of Mastermind, How to Think Like Sherlock Holmes, and of course, The Confidence Game. So they're both with us right now. Uh, and now that I'm Stop being all long-winded. Uh, they're going to start talking. So, um, Anjan Chatterjee, maybe we can just begin by saying, is, are we always talking about the same thing? If I say that, uh, you know, Kate Upton has a beautiful face and she's a beautiful woman, and if I say that this Degas painting uh, is a beautiful painting, are, are we talking about this? Am I using the word in, in the same way, or are these very different concepts? Well, not having... Um had yak liver for lunch. I'm going to try to muddle <laughs> through this answer. Okay. Um, uh, most people agreed uh, to a great extent on what faces are beautiful. Uh, people might vary on which specific face they regard as the most beautiful, but in general, people tend to agree about faces. Uh, when it comes to artwork, uh, there's, there's far less agreement. Uh, and in between, closer to faces, are landscapes. You mentioned uh, your, your bike ride in France. Uh, so in general, faces, people tend to agree uh, uh, on which faces are beautiful. Landscapes also, people tend to agree, a little less so than faces. When it comes to artwork, it's all over the place. How about what we know at the uh, kind of the level of what are now called neuroaesthetics? I mean, basically in the brain, in terms of what's going on neurochemically, are the same centers being activated? Are the same chemicals being released by all of these kinds of experiences? So in general, we think about uh, beauty as uh, a combination of sensations and activation of parts of our reward circuitry, so our pleasure centers. Uh, so when it comes to faces, it is typically a combination of parts of our visual cortex uh, that is specialized in processing faces. Uh, and that neural activity in combination with specific parts of our uh, pleasure centers, uh, these have long and complicated names like the orbitofrontal cortex and the nucleus accumbens. Uh, but it seems as though the neural uh, response of both the sensory cortices uh, and our pleasure centers is at least what the biologic underpinning seems to be for beauty. Uh, if we were to talk about landscapes, 
you still have the similar parts of our reward system that are activated, but instead of the part of the visual cortex that is tuned to faces, it's a different part of the occipital cortex that is tuned to places. Uh, so, but again, you have this general principle of a combination of sensation and pleasure that seems to be the biologic underpinning of beauty. Now, going back to your question about with artwork, so if you really like Degas and I really like Rothko, uh, even though the, the, the images that we like are very different, uh, it appears that the pleasure that we get out of that uh, is similar. So the reward circuitry then is activated in a similar way, would be activated in a similar way for you as it is for me, even though the trigger for that activation is a very different image. So let's get Maria Konnikova in involved here. So Maria, uh, in Brazil, there are more Avon ladies than members of the army. In the United States, more money is spent on beauty than on education or social services. Tons of makeup, 1,500 tubes of lipstick and 2,000 jars of skin care products are sold every minute. Now that either proves that we are just this unbelievably superficial society or that we have some kind of wiring that makes us, that, that goes back to the grasslands of Africa to our our earliest times in which certain impulses became adaptive um, that makes us still see beauty as so eminently desirable that we, we place it ahead of a lot of other more sensible things. The, the, uh, Maria, you can't ignore the evolutionary part of this, right? No, absolutely not. Um, and by the way, we are a superficial society, so let's just get that out of the way. <laughs> okay. um, but evolutionarily, um, beauty does signify certain things um, to the human mind. Um, and when I'm talking about beauty now, I'm not talking about um, some of those qualities that kind of change from culture to culture, you know, different styles of faces, different um, body types, it really depends on where you are. Um, but things like facial symmetry, things like clear skin, um, those are have traditionally been kind of symbols of health, um, symbols often of kind of good fertility. I mean, you are a good kind of evolutionary um, investment for me. And if I have children with you, then our children are probably going to survive because you're nice and symmetrical. And if you think about what makeup does, is it actually creates a lot of those cues um, that might be missing in your face. So you can make your face look more symmetrical by applying different beauty products. You can make your skin look clearer. Um, I know that, you know, as a teenager, I was a, I was a big fan of, of those types of things. I'm sure a lot of teens were. Um, as your kind of skin tone is not so even in real life, you want to even it out. And so we still use those same cues, even though they might not necessarily mean the same thing or have the same survival value these days as they did thousands of years ago. So, um, Anjan Chatterjee, as we think about this, um, one of the questions that I have, and this came up, I think you and I were in one of those little sort of discussion pits uh, at uh, TEDMED, and, and, I, I, and people were talking about whether or not, if there's a biological reaction to beauty, then is there conceivably a health or medical benefit to engaging with beauty? I mean, if I'm clinically depressed, you know, will Rothko make me feel better? You know, if, if, I'm, if I'm in pain, you know, from some actual organic syndrome, uh, can an engagement with beauty release neurochemicals that will ease my pain. Do we know much about that? We don't know a whole lot about that. Uh, there are a few experiments uh, that show, uh, for example, uh, you mentioned pain. Pain threshold changes uh, in the presence of artwork that people really like uh, in, in a way that uh, the, the threshold is higher. And it appears that uh, perhaps some of the pleasure you get out of those experiences alters the threshold uh, of experiencing pain. Uh, there is a general sense of ways in which our environment, uh, especially attractive environments, uh, probably contributes to a sense of well-being. Uh, one idea that's been quite prevalent uh, in some of this writing, although experimentally it's quite hard to prove, uh, but there is the sense uh, that natural environments, uh, that people have a better sense of well-being. You know, you send, spend uh, some time in a park or uh, in, uh, in an area of green, and that people generally tend to feel, feel better than if they're in a constructed environment. 
Um, I should point out that this is not so easy to, to prove experimentally, but there is this intuition and there is some literature uh, on this idea. So I think the, 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 the general notion that being around beauty contributes to a sense of well-being uh, is probably true. Um, all right, we have to take a break. One of the things we talked about at TEDMED, which I don't think we have time to get into now, is the way to integrate something like that into the actual clinical delivery of services. For the most part, you know, doctors probably don't aren't thinking this way. They're not saying, look, take uh, two, you know, manets and call me in the morning. Um, but uh, we're going to talk more about so how beauty... First of all, whether beauty has to be useful or not. That maybe will be our next topic after we take this break. All right, we're back. We're talking about beauty uh, and the actual nature of beauty. A little bit later on the show, we're going to talk to a facial plastic surgeon. Uh, but before that, we're talking to Maria Konnikova, writes on psychology and culture for The New Yorker. Most recent book, The Confidence Game. Uh, we did a whole show with her about confidence persons. Uh, Anjan Chatterjee uh, joining us, professor and chair of neurology at Pennsylvania Hospital, member of the Center for Cognitive Neuroscience at UPenn, uh, and the author of The Aesthetic Brain, How We Evolve to Desire Beauty and Enjoy Art. So I'm going to start in a different place than I, I thought I was going to uh, um, start. Maria, Maria, I'm going to come back to you. Um, there are things that we do know uh, about what happens when people encounter uh, other people whom they perceive as beautiful or attractive. One thing we know from social science, as I understand it, is that we are more likely to trust that person. Tell us about that. Um, that is absolutely right. We're more likely to be not just attracted on kind of an aesthetic level, but to also want to give this person a lot of things. So we think attractive people um, in different studies are more trustworthy and people who look like us are more attractive. So it's actually this double thing, which is one of the reasons why a lot of standards of beauty are culturally determined um, because what ends up happening is that people who are from a similar culture to you look like you, you think they're more attractive and you end up trusting them. There's some really cool studies when people play trust games with one another um, and you, you're trying to figure out basically, you know, how cooperative are you going to be with the other person? And what ends up happening is when um, the researchers blend the face of the person that you're playing with, with your own face, you don't realize that's happened, but you start suddenly start cooperating much more. You rank the person as much higher on all sorts of wonderful features, and you find them much more attractive. So there is this sort of, I think, affinity that's going on. And by the way, there's also research that shows that attractive people um, get better job offers. Um, they make more money. So these are things that really play out in all sorts of very real situations. And it's all based on kind of our perception that this person is someone that I like. We like to be associated with beauty. So Anjan Chatterjee, uh, just as long as we're uh, talking about clinical research, uh, we also know that uh, in answer to the poor guy who climbed that mountain to talk to the wise person, the beauty isn't perfectly platonic. It, uh, it's not uncontaminated by, uncontaminated by human thought and expectation. In fact, we know from some studies that beauty is a little bit like wine. If you slap a fancy label on it, people are going to think it's good. Uh, uh, you know, they're, they're going to e be easily fooled in a blind study, right? If you tell somebody that art is beautiful or important, they're going to think, or even that it's just from a gallery, right? They're going to think it's good art. That's right. Uh, so when I mentioned before that our experience of beauty is this combination of sensation and pleasure, uh, that whole axis is modulated by knowledge. Uh, and so there is one experiment, maybe the one you're referring to, uh, that is, uh, it was done in Copenhagen where people were shown abstract figures and in one condition, people were told that these figures were uh, were hanging in a gallery, in a fancy gallery. And in the other condition, they were told that they were just generated by some kind of random program of a computer. 
And so they're looking at exactly the same thing. There's no difference in the sensation coming in through their eyes into their brain. But in the condition where they think it's hanging in a gallery, they actually uh, say that they like them more. They think they're more beautiful. And not only that, this is accompanied by increased neural activity in parts of these, uh, these uh, reward circuits. Uh, so there is a, a way in which our knowledge, and this is perhaps where branding comes in, but uh, where reputations can come in, uh, but there is a, a sense in which uh, knowledge has an influence uh, influence on this experience of beauty. You know, um, having met you briefly, my sense of you is that you are a keenly a person keenly attuned to uh, art and aesthetics and, and beauty. Um, but in some ways, your research must be smashing up against age-old concepts of aesthetics and beauty, right? I mean, John Ruskin, the critic, famously said uh, that uh, some of the most beautiful things in the world are useless. Um, lilies and peacocks, uh, I think, were his examples. Um, so, you know, as you begin to pull apart uh, our reaction to beauty for, uh, as, first of all, a whole series series of neurophysical reactions and also begin to think about the utility of beauty, you're smashing up against one of the primal concepts of aesthetics, which is that beauty shouldn't necessarily be useful or worth anything independent from its, its state at, uh, of being beautiful. So I, how do you react to that? Well, one practical consequence of that is it's very hard to find funding to do beauty research right? <laughs> because it's not supposed to be for anything. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, in that line, there's also a, a well-known Chinese proverb that says, when you only have two pennies left in the world, uh, buy a loaf of bread with one and a lily with the other. Mm -hmm. right? so, so this notion that uh, there is, uh, I think, embedded in that proverb is the notion that beauty is not useful, uh, but it's also important. Uh, so there is that. Uh, and it also goes back to a kind of notion from the... Uh, from the 18th century, where philosophers like uh, Kant and the Earl of Shaftesbury uh, talked about an aesthetic experience as being one uh, that was described as disinterested interest. Uh, and by that, I, I take them to mean that there is a, a, a real engagement, as all of us appreciate, there's a real engagement with things that are beautiful, but it is not for something else, that the aesthetic experience is self-contained. Uh, so, so as you correctly point out, there is this whole line of thinking that what is uh, is fundamental to an aesthetic experience or an experience of beauty in that sense is that it is self-contained and not uh, by virtue of being useful in any way. Having said that, uh, I think most people also realize that that we are drawn to beauty in a way, as we were suggesting, that uh, perhaps contributes to well-being, that there are these downstream consequences of beauty that, that, uh, that predispose to a certain kind of attachment. So people will pay more money, for example, for something that is equally uh, functional but is beautiful. You know, a classic example would be the way in which people are willing, many people are willing to pay more for uh, an Apple laptop uh, than another kind of laptop, even though functionally they accomplish the same thing, but because there is a kind of aesthetic engagement uh, with the beauty and the design of this object. Uh, going back to environmental spaces, uh, there's certainly a lot of interest in how spaces can be configured in a way that are beautiful, but beautiful uh, to promote a certain kind of activity. So if you're in a school, what kind of environment uh, makes, people, uh, makes people learn better? If you're in a hospital, what kind of environment makes people heal more easily? Uh, what kind of spaces uh, in, in a religious context uh, put people into a contemplative mood, for example? So uh, I think the tension that you're drawing is one that we all struggle with, which is on the one hand, there's a core experience that is self-contained in these kinds of uh, encounters with beauty, but then there are also these uh, downstream consequences, uh, and some of which you've alluded to uh, in, the, in social psychology in the way in which beautiful people are, get all sorts of advantages in life, even when those advantages aren't necessarily warranted by their behavior. So, Maria, uh, we've got about two minutes left. I had an out-of-left-field question I was going to ask you, but do you want to just react to anything that we've just said? 
Um, sure. Well, I um, one of the things, and my work is obviously more on the human side of this, um, as in faces, but one of the things that really struck me um, when I was researching my first book, Mastermind, which was about mindfulness, was that there is so much work on healing um, and aesthetics, mm-hmm. and that you see that people in hospitals that have really nice views um, end up doing much better and often recovering better from surgery. Um, and I'm not, you know, I'm not as kind of familiar with this research, but it struck me that there might be some very interesting kind of curative impact of this. And the other thing that really intrigues me is the work that shows that um, infants are more attracted to faces that we would think of as attractive and they look at those people longer. And so you think, you know, yeah, sure, it's superficial, but is there something more to it? Does it give you some sort of greater emotional satisfaction that then in turn um, translates to better well-being and kind of better outcomes on a health and psychological level? All right, we have to take a quick break. We're going to say goodbye to Maria Konnikova, just for today, not forever. Uh, She's always uh, going to come back and be parts of other shows that we do. Meanwhile, some people are going to come and ask you to support public radio. It really helps this show. If you like this show, a show that does this kind of conversation, it really helps our show if you pledge during this. So when the nice people ask you to do something, just do it. They're very beautiful, attractive people, I'd like to say. It's the only people we allow doing our pledge drives. Is this show going to address grossly inflated funicular ticket prices, or should I just stop listening? Today's show was produced by Betsy Kaplan and me, Kion Wolf. Our intern is Hazel Cologne. The part of Bill Curry was played by Kathy Ireland. Peek behind the scenes on the Colin McEnroe Show Facebook page. On tomorrow's show, not your typical conversation about the press and the age of Trump. And now, back to Colin. All right. We've been talking a bit about beauty. Um, Let's talk a little bit more about it. But first of all, let's just say that when we talk about beauty, people talk about beauty very differently. This, for example, is how John Keats talked about beauty. Oh, attic shape, fair attitude, with breed of marble men and maidens overwrought, with forest branches and the trodden weed. Thou, silent form, dost tease us out of thought as doth eternity. Cold pastoral, when old age shall this generation waste, thou shalt remain in midst of other woe than ours, a friend to man, to whom thou sayest, Beauty is truth, truth beauty. That is all ye know on earth, and all ye need to know. That, of course, that's not uh, John Keats. That's uh, the great British actor Robert Donat uh, reading John Keats. Well, that's one way to talk about beauty. Here's how um, a certain other person would talk about beauty. There was something that troubled you. To... What is it, the face? No, she's she's very nice. I mean, is she a ten? You know what a ten is. This who is a ten? Just so I can know. Beside your wife, who is a ten? I don't. 10? I don't want to say. Well, I would say the current Miss Universe is a ten. Okay. I so mean, Elin know. is a nine. So something was off. An, an eight to a nine. Oh, an eight Ooh, to a nine. She's slipping. She's going she down. She was a solid nine. Now she's an eight to a nine. That's well, right. I just, I just <laughs> mentioned the current Miss Universe. <laughs> and that knocked her down. That, of course, is uh, Howard Stern, Robin Quivers, and the current president of the United States discussing beauty. Um, so uh, l- uh, let me just uh, remind you that we're talking to Anjan Chatterjee, professor and chair of neurology at Pennsylvania Hospital, a member of the Center for Cognitive Neuroscience at University of Pennsylvania, and the author of The Aesthetic Brain, How We Evolved to Desire Beauty and Enjoy Art. Um, so, and we'll be talking in just a second to James Shire, a, a facial plastic surgeon uh, in private practice in Tennessee. Uh, 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 but even before we get to that, um, well, first of all, Anjan Chatterjee, just to go back to the conversation we were saying before, having before, because I think this is worth mentioning, and I didn't have time to get to it. But um, 
you know, we can talk about the fact that notions of beauty are culturally conditioned and, and, and vary quite a bit from culture to culture and, and are delivered to us in ways other than biological. But one constant is the experience of beauty, right? If you never experience anybody or anything as beautiful, there's probably something wrong, right? That, that, that should be somewhere in your wiring. I think that's right. Uh, I think most people uh, experience beauty in some form or another. And as was also mentioned in the previous segment, uh, even uh, small infants uh, shortly after they're born seem to be attracted in particular to faces, beautiful faces that adults regard as beautiful. Uh, infants are uh, oriented towards uh, those faces, uh, more so suggesting again, at least at that point, there's not a lot of cultural overlay in what attracts their attention. The other, another thing that we know about personal beauty is that everybody wants more of it, or just about everybody wants more of it. I guess there are some people who are very happy. I mean, Eleanor Roosevelt was asked if she had any regrets, and her response was she wished she had been prettier. I mean, think about this. This is one of the most revered, beloved, respected, and, and accomplished women of her generation, uh, and, and so that's her answer. So, um, Anjan Chatterjee, we, we know this, right? We know that uh, the minute there is any kind of wiring for perception of beauty, appreciation of beauty, experience of beauty, there's going to be a scale set up by heartless people like <laughs> President Trump in some cases, but also a scale inside us telling us that we need more beauty. Uh, I think that's right, uh, and it is uh, can be a force for good, perhaps, as we've been talking about it, the way in which beauty can uh, can uh, convey a sense of well-being, but it can also be a force uh, for 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 bad in the sense that it uh, can leverage people's insecurities. It can make people feel bad about uh, the way they look. Uh, and uh, and uh, and that also has uh, negative social consequences. It, it has negative uh, social, social consequences, but if you have the resources to do something about it, it can have other kinds of consequences. Let's add to this conversation uh, James Shire, facial plastic surgeon in private practice in Tennessee, a former director of the facial plastic sur of facial plastic surgery at Albert Einstein College of Medicine and Montefiore Medical Center in New York. Um, welcome to the conversation we're having about beauty, beauty Dr. Jim Shire, J Dr. Jim Shire. Hey, thank you. Nice to be here. So... Um, uh, I'm actually going to read to you uh, from uh, uh, Nancy Edkoff's uh, book about beauty. She says, Attitudes toward beauty are entwined with our deepest conflicts surrounding flesh and spirit. We, we view the body as a temple, a prison, a dwelling for the immortal soul, a tormentor, a garden of earthly delights, a biological envelope, a machine, a home. We cannot talk about our response to our body's beauty without understanding all that we project onto our flesh. So in your practice, you're often, I mean, there are obviously medical reasons, reconstructive reasons why people might seek out plastic or cosmetic surgery, um, but there are also reasons that have to do with that innate notion uh, of self-worth self or wanting to be seen differently. So how do you have conversations with people about that? What kinds of conversations do you find yourself having? I think the biggest issue is the motivation behind it. And everybody has their own motivation. I think one thing that we have to understand is that um, there is a desire and a true, um, I guess, attempt to recapture youth or the feeling of youth. Youth equals beauty in many eyes. Um, and di different cultures appear to approach that one way or another, as do different periods in time. Uh, as an example, that in some cultures, you know, elderly people are revered. They're valued. In other cultures, they're not. Um, that We have many people that, you know, they just want to look, they don't want to change their appearance. They just want to look better a better version of themselves or a more youthful version of themselves. I think that's probably one of the number one motivating factors we have. Um, when we say people, what percentage of your practice is women as opposed to men? I probably am dealing with uh, two-thirds women, a third men. 
Um, you know, and that whole idea of kind of sh uh, shifting notions of co culturally created ideas about not just beauty, but what's what's OK, what's desirable. As you're saying, there are cultures where being old and looking old is venerated in a way that maybe it, it, it isn't in our culture. And and on John Chatterjee, you know, one thing that I was thinking about as I was getting ready for this show was, OK, so I'm older than anybody else who's a guest on this show. Um, so when I was 14 or 15 years old, it's like 1968, 1969, I actually remember watching a primetime drama, a dramatic TV show in which repeatedly um, an African-American character was described as beautiful and realizing that I hadn't heard that before. I mean, I know that sounds completely crazy, but the way that popular culture was shaped at, around 1968, if you were just a young kid, you know, I mean, your body might have told you Diane Carroll was pretty beautiful, <laughs> but, but I mean, your culture didn't. I mean, it was just amazing how little uh, of an aesthetic beauty standard existed outside of the white template. I don't know, Anjan, if you want to react to that. That, well, uh, I, with, well, I, well let's, let's start with Anjan, and then I'll go over to you, Jim. Okay. Yeah, so a couple of things about, uh, about that. One is uh, that the, 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 what we're exposed to has a huge impact on our notions of beauty. So there's a laboratory finding, which is that if you take a bunch of faces and you digitally combine them and average them, that the average face is almost invariably more attractive than any of the individual faces that contributed uh, to, to, to those uh, to that one particular face. Uh, and the biologic uh, claim around this is that faces uh, that harbor a variety of different kinds of features also signal greater genetic diversity. So there is this notion that uh, these kinds of mixed uh, features are very attractive. Having said that, the real-world application of that laboratory finding is that we form prototypes based on what we're exposed to. Uh, and so the general stereotype uh, that many people have the intuition of is that whatever my ethnicity is, people of the other ethnicity all look alike, right? We don't, you know, we don't differentiate them. But that's in large part due to exposure. And when people are exposed to different ethnicities or uh, grow up in environments where there's a great deal of diversity, these central notions of what beautiful prototypes are uh, tend to expand. So if you take if you go back to a bygone era where the, the well where people perhaps more likely lived in very homogenous environments and then what the media presented to them didn't expand that uh, in other directions, the prototypes that they're forming for notions of beauty are going to be rather restrictive. Absolutely. So Jim Shire's uh, Jim Shire, I know you had a reaction to that. Yeah, I think that uh, depending on what culture you're in, there's different um, ideals of beauty. I mean, this is pretty well established that um, there are certain um, groups of people or tribal um, um, enhancements to appearance, such as uh, certain tribes would scarify faces, would elongate necks uh, from youth to try to make the, uh, the neck look appear longer or um, more elegant to them or uh, to change the uh, profile of the teeth. Um, also, um, in putting discs in ears and lips and things like that were just accoutrements to beauty uh, in that particular uh, culture that in another culture may not be not only not beautiful but seem to be the opposite. Um, even and, and, that, and that's a cultural thing from uh, location, but there's also a time, a period of beauty. Um, because I think our appreciation of what is beautiful changes with time. I mean, if you go back and look up the most beautiful people in different time periods, they are going to be different from time period to time period, from Rubenesque to the 1920s and 30s to what we have today. Um, those ideal beauties, if you pick out the beautiful people of that period, they're going to be completely different. 
Right. And I think it is a much more multicultural standard now. There are always going to be Kate Uptons, but there are going to be uh, more of a mix. So, Jim, there's a moment in the movie Educating Rita, I think, where uh, Julie Waters plays a hairdresser and there's this kind of frumpy woman sitting in the chair and she holds up a picture of Princess Diana, who is still alive and quite beautiful, and says, I want to look like this. Uh, and there's that moment where Julie Waters is thinking, well, it's going to take more than a new hair hairstyle. But I'm sure you get that to a certain degree, too. People have been told something that something besides them is beautiful. And, and, and so what's your role in terms of getting them to accept what they can and can't look like? Well, I think that the number one thing that we have to deal with, no matter what it is, it's realistic expectations. Um, that's, that has to be it. And our goal isn't to change them, to make them into somebody else, but to actually enhance or improve what they do have and to give them the full potential of what's a, what would be available to them in the most natural way without looking altered. Um, and, and that's the challenge and that's the goal of what we do. All right. Um, uh, because of fundraising, I think I dare not ask another question. Uh, no, aren't we at fifty four fifty? I think we have to. I think we have to leave. I think we've got one minute left. All right. I've got just a, enough time to uh, thank everybody concerned. So I do want to thank uh, first of all uh, Dr. Jim Shire. Uh, he is facial plastic surgeon in private practice in Tennessee, and um, and Anjan Chatterjee. His book is The Aesthetic Brain, How We Evolve to Desire Beauty and Enjoy Art. Uh, also, or earlier on the show, of course, we had the wonderful Maria Konnikova, most recent book, uh, The Confidence Game. But read her work uh, in The New Yorker and also um, on, hear her on The Gist with Mike Pesco, where she has a regular feature whose name I cannot say on this particular radio station. So um, thanks to everybody who helped out. Yeah, some nice people, beautiful people very attractive people are going to ask you to pledge. Do it. If you love our show, this is a good time to make a pledge of support. We get a little extra credit when you do. All is beauty. All is beauty. All is beauty everywhere. Roses are red. Violets are blue. Beauty doesn't always follow some kind of poetic rhythm. Mariska Hargitay. <laughs>